Welcome to the WebMD Health Discovered Podcast. I'm Dr. Neha Patak, WebMD's Chief Physician Editor for Health and Lifestyle Medicine. Today, we're digging into how the changing seasons can affect our mental health. When the seasons change, so can our moods. For some of us, winter brings with it a cozy feeling and anticipation about some of the holiday season. But for others, it can bring a sense of lethargy, persistent sadness, a loss of interest in activities. These symptoms can exist on a continuum from mild to major depressive disorder. And that's where SAD fits in, seasonal affective disorder. For a lot of us, we sort of throw around a lot of these terms and we don't exactly know what they mean. Seasonal affective disorder is more than just the winter blues. It's a real and challenging condition that impacts people around the world. In this episode, we'll unravel the layers of SAD, exploring its symptoms, causes, and the strategies that each of us can use to navigate through the darker months. Joining us today is Dr. Michael Terman. Dr. Terman is the founder and president of the Center for Environmental Therapeutics, a nonprofit education agency focused on non-drug therapeutics for mental health disorders. His research and clinical work have been conducted at Columbia University. Welcome to the Health Discovered podcast, Dr. Terman. Pleasure to be with you. I'm really looking forward to digging into some of these terms with you and really digging into what we can do on an individual level to care for ourselves. I'd like to ask you about your health discovery. What was your aha moment around your work in seasonal affective disorder? I was studying the circadian timing system, changes in blood hormone levels and so forth. And then I heard a report from the National Institute of Mental Health where a patient came in with log records of his mood changes over about 30 years. And going through the calendar, it was very seasonal. He had heard that the NIMH had made a recent discovery, and that is if you turn on very bright lights, it turns off the secretion of the melatonin hormone at night. And he said, try light therapy on me and see if it makes me feel better. And boy, oh boy, this is the first case. He felt better within a few days. That started it all. That got the NIMH and people working with them in the field, like me at Columbia, to try to figure out what was going on. And we realized when we started asking people about this, that the winter change in mood was happening quite frequently. And so we jumped in on two levels. One is just try bright lights when you wake up and also repeat that in the evening to try to stretch the daytime lighting and contract the nighttime lighting of winter. That was a fairly arduous intervention up to four to six hours a day at a light box in the morning and evening. Then we realized the evening light was not that important at all. We could drop it. What was critical is the reception of a bright light signal, the way it occurs with sunrise in spring and summer. And we had to do that artificially with light therapy indoors. So how many people does this affect? We determined that about 5%, that's millions of people, 5% of the American population feels this disturbance distinctly and conforms to the criteria for a major depressive disorder. However, there's more to it than that. What are some of the typical mood, diet, and behavioral changes or predictors? How do you get specific about it? What symptoms do you look at? Well, there are the cardinal symptoms of major depressive disorder, including the blue mood at the extreme, including suicidal ideation, changes in your sleep behavior. That can go in either direction. Very short sleep or very long sleep are both defining characteristics of major depression. But for seasonal affective disorder, it is long sleep. 
The reason it's long sleep, we now know, is that the sun is rising later and our sleep is anchored to our circadian rhythm, which is anchored to the time of sunrise. There are physical symptoms that ride with the mood change. In fact, they predict the mood change in a way that you can take care to guard against this every year. Typically, you'll start feeling more fatigued upon awakening, even a month before your mood changes. Can you discuss more about how diet changes can be a symptom? Major changes in appetite are characteristic of a major depression, but can go either way. I don't want to eat at all. My family is forcing me to eat. Or... I'm gobbling all the time and gaining serious weight, up to 30 pounds over the winter season. Normally, it's much less than that, five, seven, ten pounds, but significant and definitely measurable. Your appetite begins to change from healthy, reasonable portions of summer lunches and dinners to overdoing it with pastas and other carbohydrates, you begin to notice weight gain. It's a purely physical symptom that comes along with the decrease of light availability in the morning. And this will happen a couple of weeks or a month before you actually feel down. It's very useful to detect it and say, whoops, all of a sudden I'm eating pasta and potatoes and sweets for dessert, and I wasn't doing that a month ago. That's a predictor that the depressive symptoms, as you described, are going to set in in a few weeks. And usually people don't associate the two. Once you detect that, you can intervene with light therapy at home, take care of those symptoms, and even obviate or prevent the depressive episode from occurring altogether. You've said so much that is so interesting. So I love to start unpacking some of that. So first, I think what really sticks out to me is that one, we sort of throw around these terms like, oh, I have sad or I get sad in the wintertime, uh, meaning I have seasonal affective disorder. And what I'm hearing you say is that SAD is in the category of major depressive disorder. So we may all kind of, as a group, feel worse in the wintertime or feel like our mood shifts and makes us more lethargic, but there are really clinically defined criteria to be considered as having seasonal affective disorder. So what are some of those clinical signs? What would you have to see in order to diagnose someone with SAD? First of all, I can say that you can do this for yourself by going to our website at the Center for Environmental Therapeutics, CDG.org. It will ask structured questions systematically and allow you to score the presence or absence of symptoms as they occur in different seasons. You do this retrospectively. But when you start thinking about it, you realize for the first time how seasonal a person you are. Ordinarily, people just float with it. It's part of life. And some of them float with it with major depression, which means they become essentially dysfunctional for four or five months out of the year. That's devastating. So I'd love to also then dig into something else that you mentioned. So I think what I'm understanding, and it totally makes sense, is when you are diagnosed with seasonal affective disorder, you meet the criteria for depression, as we've talked about, where it's really interfering with your ability to function in life. You have a tendency to have more sleeping than you would otherwise. And that one of the ways to see if this might be the condition you're suffering from, as opposed to clinical depression, that is sort of the more classic depression, is if light therapy works for you or not. If it does work for you, then you're more likely in the category of sad. I'm really curious about how our biological rhythms, our chronotype fits in. First, can you define chronotype for us? And then secondly, can you help us understand how that fits into seasonal affective disorder. 
So the questionnaire about chronotype asks you about how you function at various times of day, what your preferences are, when do you want to eat, when do you want to be challenged with a heavy work assignment, when do you want to go out exercising with a friend, and when do you like to go to sleep if you have no obligations the next day. Forget about the complication of having to wake up. If you put all of that information together, you get a score. Basically, it means, are you a morning person or are you an evening person? Or are you somewhere in the middle where it really doesn't matter what time of day it is? If you're a morning person, you're waking up very eagerly and before the rest of the population, you usually are feeling exhilarated when you wake up. If you're an evening person, statistically, you are more likely to experience a depressive disorder, whether it's seasonal or not seasonal. And when it becomes a struggle to wake up in winter, that's when light therapy can have a major rapid effect. What information does the online test offer? Why is the chronotype score so important? We discovered that the chronotype score mirrors the melatonin pattern taken from blood tests or saliva tests. So you can infer your melatonin timing by answering 19 questions on the web. Based on that, we can predict when in the morning light therapy is going to be most effective for you. And for a late type person, it's going to shift the melatonin cycle earlier. And it's that process of shifting the cycle earlier that is tightly correlated with the improvement of mood. Okay, so as you speak, three things come up for me. One is, I wish I was a morning person. I wish I could be that person that woke up in the morning and just was excited to get out of bed. I don't think that's ever been me. Two, I want to take that test on the website. So I will be doing that after we finish speaking. And three, light therapy. I'm hearing you say it's effective for people that have SAD, but it could be effective for people who fall out of that criteria as well in terms of shifting our mood, in terms of being able to maybe perhaps shift our sleep cycle. So I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about what does light therapy actually mean? I know that during this season, there are a lot of products being sold to us as light therapy. So what should we be looking for in the correct type of light therapy? This is an illuminating story, so to speak, because as light therapy was developed by my group and colleagues around the country, we came to the conclusion that we wanted to raise the level of light to what you would get if you were taking, this sounds very poetic, a walk on the beach 40 minutes after sunrise, not under tree cover, not on New York City streets with shadows, but out in the open. The level of light you're receiving there from the entire sky cover, not just from the sun, comes to what we call 10,000 lux, which you can measure with a meter. These meters are available on Amazon for 30 bucks and they work. You can tell what level of light you're living under and what level of light you are receiving for treatment. Normal room light is rarely above 300 lux. Now to receive that level of light, you need a large screen in front of you that projects the light in a way that you can behave normally at your desk or at your kitchen table, work on a computer, take notes, talk on the phone comfortably, and time your exposure. Can you expand a little bit more on the importance of dosing? We have the three basic elements of the dosing of light. It's sort of an analogy to dosing a drug, but differing physical quantities. One is the intensity of the light you receive, and different individuals will require different doses. But 10,000 lux is a place to start, which has worked for most people, and we don't advise anything higher than that. It's not necessary. Another aspect is how long you sit at the desk and take this treatment. 
the original patient who used the treatment at the National Institute of Mental Health, he sat there for three hours in the morning and three hours in the evening in order to get the effect, but they were using a much lower level, much lower dose of 2000 lux. Now we know that 30 minutes can provide the same input to the system as hours of exposure at a lower level. And so 30 minutes is another dosing dimension because some people will need more than that. Can you give an example of a non-responder and how light therapy works differently in different types of people? I'm thinking now of a patient who sat like a rock with 30 minutes of light therapy and we increased it to 45 minutes and he sat there like a rock. He wasn't better at all. We thought here was a case of a non-responder who had SAD, and we went up to a full hour, and he bloomed, he blossomed. That's an extreme case, and very few people need to do that. But others will get a little bit hyper and jittery with 30 minutes, and they go down to 20 minutes, and it works. So that's a process of an individual dose adjustment. So... There are the three aspects of dosing. I've talked about the intensity of the light, the duration of exposure, and critically, the time in the morning that you use it relative to your internal biological clock, relative to your chronotype. So we take the quiz, you identify what time would work best for you, but if your work commitments or your life commitments prevent you from being exposed to the light at that time for that duration? Could you sort of move it up so that it fits into what would be your an ideal schedule for you and your life? Or is that not going to work? It's going to work within limits. If your chronotype scores wants you to take the light therapy at 6.30 a.m., but you can't either get up or have responsibilities then, You say, I want to do it when my morning tasks are over at 8.30 a.m. Light therapy can have a positive effect later in the morning, but not with the same oomph as when you do it relative to your circadian cycle. I think the operationalizing of it and the way you're really laying it out in terms of considerations around dosing is so helpful. So where should we be looking to find the 10,000 lux? Is this something that you can just buy on Amazon or is there a specific place we should be looking for these devices if we want to try them? You can buy the good devices on Amazon and you can be tricked into buying the bad devices by false advertising. The bad devices, unfortunately, are less expensive than the good devices. That's one reason they attract consumers. They are tiny. They claim to project 10,000 lux, but you would have to have your eye right in front of the screen to get it. Some of them use colorations of lighting that can cause nervousness and distraction. Because they're so small, you cannot move around relative to the light source. And they don't pass muster in clinical trials. I have a blog post on CET.org that compares a wide variety of lighting devices, about 40, 45 of them and identifies ones which are likely to give you a comfortable exposure to this specific lighting signal without a disturbance. That narrows the eligible field of light boxes to about three or four companies who have taken the care to meet these criteria of the clinical trials. So beyond light therapy, anything else we should be thinking about in terms of treating seasonal affective disorder or shifts in our mood that follow a seasonal pattern? I love this question. Some people can respond to conventional antidepressants, but usually with residual symptoms. A good responder to light therapy becomes virtually symptom-free, and so that's an alternative. In fact, uh, some clinicians will advise partial responders to use both the antidepressant and light therapy. You've got to be very careful about that because 
you're putting two powerful signals into the nervous system. And that should be done only under supervision of a clinician. An insight I had from my earliest research was that you could control the circadian cycle and the melatonin cycle by giving a very dim light signal even before you wake up, but making that light signal increment in the same way that the sun comes up. So we call that dawn simulation. And the clinically tested dawn simulation takes about 90 minutes. You're sleeping through it. Your eyes are still receiving the signal. It happens in the bedroom automatically. It's quite wonderful, except that the commercial devices currently available in the U.S. don't replicate the signals that were used in the clinical trials. But it answers one of your questions. What if waking up at 6.30 for my bright light session is just impractical for some reason? Well, having a dawn signal in bed come up automatically and peaking at 6.30 will also wake you up and will also have an antidepressant effect. I think that's the future of light therapy. I read about negative air ionizers. Can you tell us a little bit more about them and how they work? While we were searching for a placebo control for light therapy, we came across a radically different intervention. We hit upon this method of negative air ionization. It's an air cleaning method that goes back 50 years that puts out a high stream of electrons into the atmosphere and precipitates out dust particles and so forth. So it sounded like we could convince people to use negative air ions as a placebo control by turning off the negative air ionizer. They wouldn't notice the difference. We can't smell or feel or see negative air ions. But we could say, here's an air ionizer. You're going to use that at the same time another group is using a light box relative to your melatonin cycle. The idea was it wouldn't work. However, this prompted us as scientists to say, well, what if we turn on the negative air ionizer and we turn it on at a super high level, which is greater than what's used in a normal home ionizer. Our research subjects use the ionizer at the same time they would use the light therapy. They got better too. The high density of negative air ions is doing something active. And when we lowered that dose, it became a placebo. So is it the more the better? People have asked, can I use negative air ions and light therapy and put them together at the same time? And one irresponsible manufacturer actually marketed such a device. The answer is no. Negative air ions flow to the best available electrical ground in your area and your light box is grounded because it's plugged into the wall. If you were to do negative air ionization at the same time, the light box might feel better, but you won't. So it has to be done separately and you have to control for other electrical devices active in the room. Wow. I have taken away so much that I am hoping is going to be sleep changing for me, if not life changing. I am so appreciative of this conversation. I'd love to give you the closing. Do you have action items that you think our listeners should take away with them? People who might be experiencing SAD or people who might be just having sort of lower moods, wanting to shift their sleep cycles. What are some of your key takeaway points? Do this responsibly and take what I would call validated self-assessments so that you're not just or working on the basis of intuition. And when you go to CEG.org, you'll see three types of assessments, which will give you immense information, which you can either use on your own or present to a clinician and say, look, here's who I am. Here's how I've self-diagnosed. Now let's work from that. Thank you so much. We've talked to Dr. Michael Terman about ensuring that you're using reliable sources to assess yourself for what may be going on. 
and then reliable sources to make sure when you're intervening, you're using the correct and appropriate intervention, whether that's light therapy or negative air ionization. To find out more information about Dr. Michael Terman, visit the Center for Environmental Therapeutics website, CET.org, which features highlights of Dr. Terman's research and clinical work at Columbia, along with critique and comparison of commercial light therapy devices, surveys of light therapy for both seasonal and non-seasonal disorders. Free access to Dr. Terman's circadian rhythm self-assessment and treatment guidance for light therapy is available at chronotype-self-test.info, and we'll have that information in our show notes as well. Thank you for listening. Please take a moment to follow, rate, and review this podcast on your favorite listening platform. If you'd like to send me an email about topics you're interested in or questions for future guests, please send me a note at webmdpodcast at webmd.net. This is Dr. Neha Bhattak for the WebMD Health Discovered Podcast.